Good evening, everybody. It's Thursday night. It's seven o'clock. Welcome to our uh, 30 minute webinars. Um, this week, I am delighted to be joined by Strategic Partnerships Advisor for Activity Alliance, Jess Cook. Uh, Jess is also an RDA UK trustee, so you are very welcome this evening, Jess. Thank you for coming. Um, Jess is going to be taking us on um, a whistle stop tour, I should say, of the social model of disability and our use of language. Um, what you're seeing tonight is part of a longer presentation, um, and we may well persuade Jess to um, record the, the full thing um, another time um, so that uh, there's, there's, we, we can go through some of these things in more detail. But I know you're going to find this evening's sessions really, really helpful, everybody. Um, because of the amount of information that we're going to try and get in, there probably won't be time for a Q&A. So what I suggest is, because I'm sure there probably will be questions, if you do have things after the event that you would like to know, which just doesn't have time to cover tonight, why don't you pop me an email at cward at rda.org.uk, um, either during or after, um, and I will make sure um, Jess and I have a chance to go through that those questions in the next day or so and get back to you. So without further ado, um, I will uh, put you in the capable hands of Jess. Thank you very much for coming. Brilliant. Thank you, Caroline. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to launch straight into this because of the time we've got. So bear with me while I share my screen. Caroline, if you can give me the thumbs up when you can see that, that'll be amazing. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Right. OK, so um, let me put this into presentation mode. And there we go. I'm getting good at this today. Um, OK, so um, thanks for inviting me here. As Caroline said, I work for a charity called Activity Alliance, who are funded by Sport England to be the equality partner for um, disability in sport and physical activity and effectively we help organizations to improve and individuals to be more comfortable and confident with working with disabled people. I've got a really really quick whistle top tour and a part of a presentation to share with you today in a half an hour that we've got so I'm going to talk about language and the social model and I've got a little video for you and a little quiz so I'm going to teach you about annotation as well on the zoom so wish me luck everyone. Okay, so the definitions of the social model and disability, I just wanted to take you through what that meant first off. Now we all know the Equality Act is in place and we all know that it's part of law, but actually not many people completely understand what that means. So I just wanted to let you know that the Equality Act states that anybody is defined as having a disability if they have a long standing and limiting disability or illness, impairment or health problem or condition that affects and restricts the activity, activities in any way. Now, this needs to be standing and long term for longer than 12 months. So people, it covers what we wouldn't normally think as the traditional areas of disability, such as somebody with a hearing impairment, um, visual impairment, somebody that's uh, got a, a limb impairment, either upper or lower, but also a wheelchair user as well. But it also, the bit about the Equality Act means that it covers a huge other element of individuals, such as mental health, such as a Parkinson's, such as uh, breathing problems, such as somebody that's um, had cancer recovered but have long-term effects from that. So there is a huge rare of um, individuals that are covered by the definitions of disability. And it's really important that we understand that it's not just the traditional physical learning sensory that everybody kind of associates with disability and disabled people. I just wanted to show you kind of what that splits off into um, roughly around the population. Now, this isn't definite and precise because we cannot get that information. But roughly, we know that the estimations for the chart on the left hand side show where the impairment groups sit. And you can see from the first four that they are very much linked to um, long term health conditions. Um, so you've got long term pain and long term health conditions, which could be anything at all, absolutely anything at all, heart, lung conditions, um, problems with pain, problems with um, uh, uh, recovery from injury and illness, anything like that. The mobility will cover people that are also wheelchair users, but also people that have uh, walking 
problems they don't might have back pain or leg injuries and things like that so it shows you kind of where the the split off of impairments can be the traditional impairments such as hearing and visual are quite low down on the list and then even further down on the list would actually be purely wheelchair users so it's really important that we kind of understand how disability and impairment sits and the right hand side is the gender split so again, that's looking at kind of where um, our male and female splits compare to what the impairment might be. Now, some of these um, splits and the long term conditions and the impairments might be related to historical data. So, for instance, dexterity is much, much higher in women than it is in men. And that's probably because traditionally women have always been seen to do those minute dexterity um, jobs such as typing or sewing and things like that. But as we're going through time and the generations are moving forward, the roles between men and women are massively merging. So women will do man's jobs and men will do what's traditionally seen as women's jobs. And we think over time the gender split between impairment groups will change. So there is a little something in there about the autistic spectrum disorder. It's always traditionally been seen as a, a very male area of um, an impairment and a, a long term um, learning difficulty. But there's more and more stuff coming out now. Of actually, women and females and children, young girls are getting diagnosed, but it's been kind of uh, concealed by um, a mental health area as well so looking at anxiety or depression and the two are kind of getting a bit mixed up because girls are very very clever at hiding their feelings and, and changing them into something different so the, the numbers around that I think as time goes on will change as well. Um, I want to then to talk to you about the um, social model of disability. So you may well have heard of the models of disability. Now they come into two forms. You've got the medical model of disability that was um, developed in the 1960s. It was written just to kind of show how disabled people work. And effectively, it was about the fact that a disabled person has a complete responsibility to change how they work. Um, live in society and it's their responsibility to ensure that they can get around in the environment. Um, it's their responsibility to change people's opinions. It's their responsibility to get up a flight of steps if they're a wheelchair user. And um, you may remember in the 80s and 90s, there was a huge big push around disabled people saying we want rights, we want our own choice, we want our own um, understanding and acceptance in society. So they then decided by themselves to write a new model called the social model of disability. And that completely flipped around what the medical model was saying. The social model of disability turned around and said, actually, I can't change my disability. I can't alter the way that I am. This is how I am. This is who I am. And this is how I do things. But actually, it's about the environment around me that needs to change and improve to ensure that I can be included in what you're doing. So steps aren't necessarily the only access point into a building. There is other ways of people getting in. And in some cases, they're not there at all. Lifts um, and automatic doors are put in where and that, when they can be. Floor surfaces are changed or an alternative way of um, either covering that floor surface or getting through on that floor surface is done as well. The other thing that it looks at was people. So it was about the attitude of individuals as well. So kind of saying the perceptions of how disabled people are and who they are needs to be massively improved by non-disabled people. If they have better perception, then there will be less barriers around for disabled people to be able to fit in. And it's about everybody having equal rights and for disabled people not necessarily to think they have to apologise for like getting given something or having access to something. It's about them having that right to do that, whichever they might feel. I'm gonna show you a little video um, and just bear with me while I get this to play, but I just want you to listen to kind of what they're saying and, and what that looks like. I always felt being a disabled person was a problem. After learning about social model, it challenged me to look at disability completely differently. I myself were, was, was able to gain some confidence and um, self-esteem. Social model basically says we are people with impairments and those impairments 
clearly have an impact on how we live our lives. But the impairments are not the things which disable us. I'm disabled by the world around me, and if the world was more accessible, I would be less disabled, and then I would just be left with my impairment, i.e. what doesn't work. It's not that my legs don't work that's disabling me. It's the fact that if I want to, you know, if I'm on a flat surface, I can wheel around fine, I'm wonderfully happy. It's only when I come up to a flight of stairs. As a wheelchair user, you have a slightly easier job of explaining the social model. Whereas if you're trying to explain the less physical barriers, it's much harder. There's barriers everywhere in life to do with how we communicate. Uh, to do with people's attitudes. Discovering the social model actually was a massive liberation on another level. Yeah, I was being treated differently, and no, it wasn't me being deficient. It was everybody else's social anxieties that were being projected onto me. The blame for you not fitting in is no longer on your shoulders. Suddenly, my disability is out there and not in here. It was what made me realise uh, that I was something beyond the thing that other people thought I was. It's a real liberating thing, but it also means you can change it. We can say to the world, look, you must put a lift in this building. You must make sure that the signage is readable for people with visual impairments. If you want that equality to be real, you've really got to then tackle the inequality people are experiencing in schools, in workplaces, with transport. The main reason that the social model, I think, is important to disabled people is that it allows us to be a community. You achieve a, a whole lot more as a group. As long as we, as disabled people, make sure that our voices are heard and that all those people that support us also have their voices heard, I think, I think we will get there. I hope that Scope is doing work that will help disabled people to become prouder of who we are, pushing boundaries around who can be included and where. Come the glorious day if it ever came what, 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 where all the barriers went, you know, we, we'd just be people with impairments. We, we wouldn't be disabled people uh, anymore. Find out more about Scope's work and how to get involved by clicking below to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Okay, so, um, as you might have kind of listening to what they're being said there, it's kind of really sh shaping and supporting you to understand what the social model means and how it can affect people in lots of different ways. And there was one of the things that one of the ladies said about there is liberation and it's effectively giving people a voice to be able to say, this isn't working for me, can we change it? And I think that's what we have a responsibility to do as a sector and as uh, the RDA to be able to go to individuals and say to them, what do you want? What can I do to help improve your experience here? What's your voice? And I think if you don't take anything else away from today, that's one thing you probably should do because we need to start giving the participants that we've got within our centres the voice to be able to change, make adaptions to, or just ask questions which they might not have the opportunity to do or even think that they've got the ability to do in the um, in the environments that you've got. So um, I just wanted to show you that from the social model side of it. Um, within Activity Alliance, we've um, produced something called the 10 principles. Now, as Caroline said, these are 10 principles, as they say, um, but they go into in-depth areas around communication, around marketing, around engaging the audience and support and reassure. And I'm not going to have time to go through any of that today with you. But the most important thing that I want to talk to you about is um, communication, but linked to language and tone. Now, I put up on the screen all of the, the 10 principles and effectively the disabled people are telling us that if we communicate in the right way, if we don't focus solely on the disability that we see before us and think about us as our individual selves and the value that we might have for doing that activity. And then we also mix that with reassurance and allowing people to share their experiences and feel that they're being welcomed. You've done it. Brilliant. That's what you need to do to ensure that disabled people stay and come to continue doing riding or um, any other equestrian area within what you're offering. And I think that is what we need to remember as well, that we take away the fact that disabled people are telling us quite clearly that these 10 principles are the things that will help us get engaged and stay engaged in the activity you're offering.
But this is where you all come in. So in, on your screens in front of you, and I hope this is in the same place for everybody, if you go to the top of your screen, you will see a little box drop down and a word that says annotate. It's a little pencil. If you click on that, you'll then see stamp with a tick above it. And if you click on that, you'll see a, um, a little tick or a love heart or a star. Now, I only want you to use nice things. I don't want you to use the crosses or the arrows or the question marks today. It's the tick, the star or the heart. They are your three options. Choose your weapon. And then what we're going to do is I want you to go through this. So I'm going to show you what it looks like. So I'm going to go with a star today. Uh, we're going to go through this and we're going to you're going to look through all of these words and you're going to tell me which are really nice words I don't want you to tick in any of the bad words and then we'll do this later so I'm hoping that if I do this there we go so it should look like that okay there was a hand up from Julie can I help Julie No? Okay, let's get on with them. So I'm hoping that you've all um, got your stamps. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to go through the board. If you can click on the screen, all of the good words, then that would be amazing. If you can let me know all of the good words. Sorry, can't see stamps. Can you see any of the um, annotated? Can anybody? Can somebody put some drawings on there? Okay, is that because it's not been open, Caroline? So what I'm getting on my screen is I can see view options at the top. Um, and if I click down on view options, I can see a click to annotate. And um, so that's how I'm accessing it there. Um, let me see. Yeah, so I can, I can do that. So I don't know if anyone else has got, if you just put, go to the top of the screen and see, view options you might see a drop down menu there to do annotate okay we've got lots of people coming through and saying there's no options to annotate right well what i'm going to do then is i'm going to do this on my own <laughs> um, there's uh, it doesn't normally work this way so let's see how we go so what i'm going to do then is um I'm going to go through this screen and I'm going to play on a game with on my own. Caroline, if you want to join in, then you're more than welcome to help me. Um, I haven't done it like this before, so wish me luck, everyone. Um, right, so we're going to start at the top left and we're going to work our way across. So handicap is a bad word. Oh, it's not working. Why is it not working? I think I can put them in. Okay, good. Because I've now lost control. <laughs> going well Caroline it's going well okay so um handicap is a bad word um so it won't uh, the word handicap comes from the 1700s in the Napoleonic Wars um gentlemen were coming back from the war injured they um there was no such thing as a welfare state they were sitting on the streets with a cup or a cap in hand and that is where that word has come from it's still used massively across europe and across america it's the translation of disability but in the uk it's not a good word that we use um it's very much linked to uh the uh, medical model of disability so we need to be very aware that it's not a word that we wish people to, to use and to kind of um, have as far as that's concerned. So Caroline, if you can put my cross in there for me, if you move the screen along, it will automatically come up. Oh, there we go. I've done it right. OK, um, disabled persons or people. That's a positive word. You would have heard from the video. A gentleman said that if there was no limitations, no barriers, no precedents, no uh, prejudice, sorry, um, there wouldn't be the word disabled. So they would just be a person. Um, and that's what we want to get to. So we use disabled person as a positive word all the time within our organisation. And it's the word that's that's used without throughout the social model. Deaf, again, is an accepted word. Um, people from deaf community and deaf societies have accepted that word. It's the word that they wish to be addressed by. And it's to effectively say somebody with complete 
hearing loss, um, they will be deaf and it's an accepted term that they're using. Non-disabled, again, is the right language to use. We have um, disabled people and non-disabled people. If you don't have an impairment or a health condition, you haven't got anything disabling you from doing anything within society. So you will be a non-disabled individual. Impairment is a good word. Again, you would have heard from the video, they said that the gentleman said he wouldn't be a disabled person, he would just be a person with an impairment. Impairment reflects the medical condition that might be or the, the disability that sits behind that will become an impairment. So I have an upper arm physical impairment, which means that I don't have an arm on my right side and I've got a very small arm on my left. But actually there's nothing that affects me during my life unless you put me in a room with a round door handle and then I can't necessarily open it again, but eventually I'll find my way out. So I'm not disabled, but I have an impairment. Mental health difficulty, health condition or illness. I haven't put them all on there because there isn't not, not enough room, but they are absolutely accepted terms, both by Mind and Rethink, who are the leading mental health charities. So again, we go by what they're telling us and they are saying that difficulty, illness and problem are all fine currently. Partially sighted, again, it's a great, it's, it's a great word. It's a word that's used. It's a word that's accepted. You have partial sight or you don't. You have full sight or you don't. And again, it's an accepted word by uh, all of the sight organisations. Invalid, massively don't go there. The same, it sits in the same area as handicapped. It's a very, very old word that we shouldn't be using now. The same to be said with cripple. It shouldn't be a word that's used. Now, this next word, um, person with an impairment or disability, a person with an impairment is a positive word. If you said, because that's what they have, as we were talking about above, if it said a person with a disability, that wouldn't be a word to be used around um, as far as a social model is concerned, but you will hear it quite regularly. Some disabled people do prefer to be known as a person with a disability rather than a disabled person because they don't necessarily understand the, the reasons and the builds behind why that language is set up. But at the end of the day, with those two words, you listen to the individuals that you're working with to how they prefer to be used um, and how to be addressed. But they all have names. So I would hope that you would address them by their names rather than the fact of putting a label on them before they've even started. OK, moving to the next um, line, mute is a negative word. If somebody has no speech, they won't be completely mute. They won't be completely silent. Sound will still come from them. So they will be with person without speech. Uh, mutist or selective mutism is a medical term. And again, that will follow the medical model. And we're using the social model here. Deaf and dumb, deaf, dumb. No, not a good word. It's not used. Um, it's, it's a learning difficulty, learning disability without speech or without communication. So we need to be very aware of how we're using that. Visually impaired, positive word. It's a word that's used throughout, again, with partially sighted. Um, and it's used across the, their sites, uh, charities. Physical disability. It is used and it is accepted. Um, you tend to look at that as far as kind of um, sitting in the brackets of physical disability. It probably should be physical impairment, but it is still a word that's accepted. Retard or retarded? It's not. Stay away from it. It's not a word that we want to be seen or used within our organisation. Wheelchair user, going back to the left. Yes, absolutely. You are using the chair to get yourself from A to B. You are using it as part of yourself to be able to mobilise yourself and, and work your way around wherever you might be. Suffers from is a negative word. It sits in the easiest way to explain it that I don't, I don't suffer from my impairment, but I might suffer from a headache, but the headache's going to go. My impairment never will. I won't wake up tomorrow morning and suddenly have a right arm. It's, it's just not going to happen. But I might wake up tomorrow morning and not have a headache if I had one this evening. So that, that's the kind of the way to look at it. You don't suffer necessarily from a disability or, um, or impairment or health condition because they're always going to be there. They're not going to necessarily improve and go away. Spastic, I would hope that you would all know that that's a negative term. The fact that Scope changed their name from the Spastic Society to Scope. 
Hard of hearing is a good term. It's slightly starting now to change to hearing impairment as opposed to hard of hearing. And this is one of the only words that has changed in probably about 10 years. So language does move, but doesn't move that fast. Blind is accepted term. It's a term that's used by all of the, the visual um, charities. And again, you either have sight or you don't. So you will have blind sight. Um, normal, no, L who is normal? Um, I might be normal for all of, any of you know, normal could be that we're all supposed to have orange hair and blue skin. We just, you just don't know. There is nothing out there that says what is normal. Learning disability, absolutely, it's an accepted term. Wheelchair bound, no, and it goes back to the same reason as wheelchair user. You're not bound to your chair, you're not stuck in your chair, you move out of it to go to bed, to um, use the, the facilities, the toilets, showers. Some people can either move from their chair to a sofa in the evenings when they might be watching the telly. So they aren't bound to their wheelchair, they're able to get in and get out. Able-bodied, which is used a lot, it's not able-bodied. It really restricts what you're talking about as well. It really reflects it more around physical impairment rather than anything else, because you're mentioning the body rather than it being a sensory impairment or learning um, difficulty, disability or long-term health condition. So if we're gonna use that, we need to be thinking about non-disabled. And the last one is dwarf. It's an accepted term by all of the dwarf charities. There's about five and a half thousand dwarfs in the country. And they at the moment are accepting the term dwarf. So achondroplasia is the medical term, but short stature and dwarf are acceptable. Um, you will get sent this. So I'm not going to talk to you about this at the moment, but you will get extra reading for it. And then it's just the last things that I wanted to just show you about is let, lag, language needs to be done in a positive form. It needs to be a positive thing. We always need to think about it, but do not worry if you get it wrong. Just apologize, ask what they would prefer as an accepted term and move on from there. Positive language and negative language as well comes through. So we need to think about how we're putting the tones of our information out there. So the tone needs to be a positive tone rather than a negative tone. So the first one is our sports club and able-bodied people love seeing disabled people joining an activity. They probably didn't mean that in a negative term, but actually if they've said our sports club, disabled and non-disabled people are actively encouraged to join in, it completely changed the way of that sentence and how you feel about you as a, an organization or a setting that disabled people might go. The second one is looking at plain English. Do not swallow a thesaurus or a dictionary when you're putting sentences together because people don't know what you're trying to say in the most important terms. As you can see from those two bottom sentences, the final one says our policy is to have a workplace free of discrimination. If you have a complaint, tell somebody effectively. That's quick and decisive and to the point. And I think that's where I'm going to leave you. Thank you ever so much, um, Jess. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm very grateful to you for, for putting so much in uh, in what turned out to be a surprise 30 minutes. Um, I, I appreciate you for you had longer, so thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone um, uh, who joined us this evening um, will have got um, a lot out of that. I'm sure you will, um, but also perhaps it's whetted your appetite for um, if we persuade Jess to um, record the, the the full piece of that presentation. Um, we'll we'll circulate that when that's available. Um, and I and I would really really encourage um, all of your network to um, to find a way to watching this presentation once it's once it's up there. Um, thank you very much for the um, the nice comments coming in. Um, that's 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 really really kind of you. Um, I got a huge amount of, out of Jess's presentation when I heard this for the first time. Um, and I think that RDA can learn a huge amount from this, but also I really hope that what you get is some confidence because a lot of what you were going through there, Jess, I'm sure people were thinking, well, that's great. I already do that. So that's great. Let's, let's take confidence about how we're using language well and learn where we're using it not so well um, and not being afraid to call people out on language that we shouldn't be using. And having the confidence ourselves to ask people about their preferred use of language. So um, we've reached our 7.30. Um, absolutely amazing, Jess, to do that on, 
half time, given that you thought you had an hour. You're a legend. Um, I will let you all enjoy your evenings. Thank you ever so much for joining us. Um, and I hope to see some of you, if not all of you, uh, for uh, next week's uh, webinar uh, on Thursday. Thank you guys and have a very good evening. Goodbye. <laughs>